When you go up the stairs to the Esther Hazy Community Museum, the first room you'll come across is the military or gun room. On display in this room are multiple different types of guns, from handguns to shotguns. Esther Hazy Museum has a wide range of weapons on display. One key item on display in this room is the Napoleon era walking stick, which concealed a sword within it. This item is a more recent addition to our museum, only having been donated in the summer of 2022. On the south wall of the room, a range of bullets have been collected within a display case. Many visitors of the museum remarked that collecting these bullets is one of the toughest parts of obtaining a collection, such as these, as not all bullets are easy to come across, and some are even removed from production in stores. There is a reason why this room has been nicknamed not only the gun room, but the military room as well. On the walls, you'll see multiple photographs which display soldiers, including soldiers from the First and Second World Wars. In addition to the photographs on display, the museum has a wide range of uniforms, helmets, and even field phones, which would have been used during war times. To find out more about these war artifacts, please check out our video, which has already been posted on them, and which we will be linking below. After taking your time to look through the first room on the second floor of the Esther Hazy Community Museum, you'll move on to the second, which is a replica of a bedroom. In this room, a wide range of items are on display, which you'll see throughout the section of this video. This room is home to one of the many mannequins that calls the museum home, and can be seen here in this video pushing a wicker bassinet. Bassinets such as this one became popular in the 19th century when the royal families began to use them. Prams like these could sometimes be extreme works of art, having intricate designs on them which would show different levels of wealth. Not everyone could afford a pram when they first came into production, but by the late Victorian era, more and more people were able to purchase a baby carriage, and new luxury models came out with names such as Princess, Duchess, Balmoral, and Windsor. A personal favorite item of mine in this room is the curling iron, which you just saw. A curling iron such as this was used in a time before they could be plugged in and heated up with electricity, so in order to get their curling iron up to temperature, they'd hold it over a kerosene lamp, such as this one, before wrapping their hair around it. This is not the only hair-related item within this room. Up on the opposite side of the dresser, you'll find what is called a hair pot. A hair pot was used in a time when certain supplies for stitching and jewelry were low. So when, when women brush their hair, they pull out the loose hairs from the brush afterwards and place them within the pot. The hair would be used either as a string or thread, or even be used as stuffing within some sewing, such as pin cushions or even small pieces of furniture. Additionally, the hair could be stuffed and sewed into what were called rats, which were used to bulk up women's hair for certain styles. On a small vanity across from the bed, you'll see a basin and watching pitcher, which would have been used for bathing before a time with running water. On the ground next to it is, of course, the matching chamber pot, which would have acted as a bathroom during the night and cold when it was not possible to make a trip out to the outhouse.
Next to the bedroom is the ladies' sitting room, which is a beauty all on its own. From the unique green wallpaper to the works of art on display, this room is a true gem. Immediately upon entry to the room, you'll see a beautiful old wedding dress, which once belonged to a woman from the area named Ruja, who is an opera singer as well as a secretary for one of the town's local lawyers. Before her death, Ruja left the Esterhazy area, but donated much of her estate to the museum upon her passing, including this wedding dress and a photo album which sits below it. Various pieces of art line the east wall of this room. Each piece is unique and beautiful in its own way. A person could truly spend hours memorizing each of these individual pieces of art. On the shelves in the south wall are multiple different hats and hat pins. Hat pins have been used since the early 1400s, though none within our museum are that old. The hat pin remain, regained popularity in the late 1800s when fashion at the time had women pinning their hair into ornate and extravagant hats. Hat pins have a unique history as women found a secondary use for the ornamental pins. They could be used as a weapon in self-defense. This second use came largely due to the time in which the fashion craze began. During the Industrial Revolution, when many women began working away from home and started to move the streets unchaperoned by family members for the first time. While this freedom may have been thrilling for women, it also increased the harassment women experienced from unsavory men, and thus the hat pin became a woman's weapon of choice for discouraging harassment such as this, as the pin was easy to conceal and all took was one good jab to, det uh, to deter any unwanted attention. Due to the secondary use, by 1910, hat pins were declared a national and international threat, and numerous countries began to impose restrictions of any hat pins that are over 9 inches long. On the north wall of this room, just below the windows, sits an old trunk. Trunks such as these could be called steamer trunks, cabin trunks, or traveling trunks. These trunks were originally used to ex for extended trips that could be taken on steamships, train, stagecoach, or even when going to boarding school. The design of these trunks could be quite elaborate. The steamer trunk has a distinct feature as they have a curved or barrel top. Additionally, trunks like these can weigh as much as 100 pounds. It isn't uncommon to see trunks such as these used as furniture or storage in present day, but the trunks themselves have been used around the world for thousands of years. The final artifact which we'll be taking a deeper look at within this room is the Singer sewing machine. There are two Singer sewing machines within this room, one which is, next, one which is built into the desk and the other which has its own carrying case. There is in fact another sewing machine within the museum on the first floor. It can be seen in the dining room, the last room which you'll pass through before heading up the second floor. Isaac Merritt Singer invented the world's first practical sewing machine in 1850. Since then, sewing machines have advanced greatly in design and technology. When Singer, while Singer himself did not invent the first sewing machine, he made many advances in sewing machine industry, such as introducing payment plans, which made sewing machines something that any household could obtain. There have been over a dozen different models of Singer sewing machines since the first one in the 1850s. One of the many early doctors of Esterhazy was Dr. Hugh Herbert Christie. Dr. Christie was born in Martintown, Ontario in 1878 and graduated from McGill University in 1906. From there, he started his own medical practice here in Esterhazy. Dr. Christie eventually returned to Ottawa when he was appointed Supervisor of Medical Services for Selected Services in 1940. In the March of 1945, unfortunately, Dr. Christie passed away after a lengthy illness. Another early doctor in Esterhazy was Dr. Robert John Key. Dr. Key, who was from Peel County, Ontario, he held a practice here for about five years before he specialized in eyes, ears, nose, and throat and returned to Ontario where he continued to, to work. One of the main early doctors in the area was Dr. William Gordon Mackenzie, who was born and raised in Deloraine, Manitoba. He obtained his medical degree from the University of Manitoba. They soon moved to Church of Saskatchewan, where he began his long and distinguished career alongside his wife. Together, they made house calls in all sorts of weather, delivered babies, and did surgery on kitchen tables in houses made of sod with dirt floors. 
Being a doctor in pioneer days also meant being a dentist as well as a veterinarian, but luckily his nurse wife was by his side. Dr. McKenzie uh, did house calls and started out using a team of horses, then a snowplane, and finally a car. Though with the car, he was often driven by other young men from place to place, as his patients were scattered all over the area. Dr. McKenzie was a very accomplished surgeon as well. It is noted that he saved one woman whose appendix burst while she was six months pregnant in 1945, saving not only her life, but the baby's as well. This baby later went on to marry his own granddaughter. The doctor worked well into his 70s, very dedicated to his work and patients. Dr. McKenzie moved to Snowy Plain, Alberta in 1975 to live with his granddaughter and her family. Ten years after the passing of his wife, he moved away a year later in the May of 1976. Many of the artifacts in this room have been donated by the doctors we've talked about, as well from the old St. Anthony's Hospital, which, as of the summer of 2022, is still standing north of the new or current hospital, which Dr. McKenzie is photographed outside of in 1950. Florence Gray donated many things to the Esterhazy Community Museum, including this porcelain doll which was made in the 1890s and can be seen on the west wall of the room. This doll was a gift from her parents in the early 1900s and was brought over from England. As a child, Florence was rarely allowed to play with this treasure. It was something that was made to look at, not play with. At five years old, it is likely very difficult for Florence not to be able to play with such a jewel like this one, as that was the age in which she was gifted the doll. But due to these rules, the doll has remained in wonderful condition. Florence herself donated the doll to the museum in 2015 when she was 100 years old. A communion dress, which once belonged to Violet Rosada, is also on display within this room. This dress dates back to 1927 or earlier. Photographs of Violet Rosada wearing the dress are on display on the north wall of the nursery next to the room's entry. A final note within this room is the handmade doll which came from France and was purchased sometime between 1935 and 1945 by James Hannes. The woman he bought this doll from made dolls for her own children and James acquired his for his wife as a memento of his time serving in France where he met some friendly people. All of this took place during the 1939 to 1945 Second World War era. This doll was donated to the museum by his family in 2015. One final piece of the Esther Hazy Museum's second floor is the Millennium Quilt. This quilt was created in the year 2000 and was dedicated to pioneer women. This quilt outlines different key points of our community, and you can see a deeper look at it here in this video. Thanks for watching. We hope to see you at the Esther Hazy Community Museum soon. not subscribe to Esther Hayes Community Museum's YouTube page.